in this uh, chapter 14. I need somebody to read verses 1 through 5. Then I looked, and lo, on the mount of Zion stood the Lamb, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpers playing on their harps. And they hmm. sing a song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elder. No one could learn <clears throat> that song except the, the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are just. It is, it is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and these have been redeemed from mankind, and first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouths no lie is found, for they are spotless. <clears throat> hey, this is an interesting uh, intro of the 144,000. We were into the 144,000 earlier in the reading of the book of Revelation. Chapter 7. In chapter 7, that way we dealt with the 12 <clears throat> tribes of Israel, and each tribe had 12,000 uh, represented, and, and they ended up to 144,000. In uh, this introduction of the 144,000, these were, say they were marked with God's name, they were worshipers. And uh, there are the angelic announcers that we're going to run into uh, chapter 14, 6 through 11. And we're going to have the different angels doing various announcing. Now, uh, the, the whole chapter divides into two sections. First is the 144,000 section, and the second section is the angelic announcers. Now, uh, the first angel, of course, said, Fear God. The second angel says, Babylon the great is fallen. Now, in the Confraternity Bible, which is the Catholic Bible, in the footnote, they said Babylon was one particular nation or empire or rulership. You mentioned last week. Who is Babylon? What is Babylon? Rome. Rome. Okay, and Rome has been pictured as that particular picture. Now, whether it's pagan Rome or papal Rome, uh, it depends on where we are in the course of events. Now, the third angel, of course, gives warning against the mark of the beast, which is kind of interesting. And uh, we did discuss that the seven day Adventists say, what is the mark of the beast? Well, it's 666, but what do they say it happens to be? The mark on your hand or your hand? The name. Well, no, but what was the mark of the beast, according to the Adventists? Oh. This is a, it's not a trick question. Six six six. Well, yeah, that's the that's the that's the that's what it adds up. But they say it's Sunday worship, and the true believers are supposed to be going to church on Saturday. Otherwise, you got the mark of the beast, and you got to stamp on your forehead because you go to church on Sunday. So if you go by going to church on Sunday, we got the mark of the beast on us. Uh, anyway, that is the accusation, but not so. In the various approaches, there's the historicist approach, as far as dealing with the seven symbolic histories of chapter 12 and 14. And the historicist says that this section of scripture is a vision of the end of the age, when Christ will come and gather his own unto himself. The preterist will say that it's a vision of the coming of Christ to gather and preserve in his church from judgment that was to befall Jerusalem. The futurist takes the approach that it's a vision of the coming harvest at the end of the age, when Christ will separate the wicked for judgment. And then finally, idealist says it's a vision of the last judgment and the coming of Christ at the end of the age. Of course, my preference is the historical approach that, that Christ is coming in Galilee's own. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says simply this, that is appointed for man once to die, and after that the judgment. That doesn't sell books. For Blood Moon sells books and gets people to the theater. Uh, the bridles, we're going to be talking about the the horses' bridles have blood up to their uh, the bridles, and Russia is supposed to be invading Israel. And this is all part of modern prophetic teaching that uh, is exciting and, and sells books and gets people to come down to the theater, but it contradicts with Hebrews 9 27, as says a point if a man wants to die, after that, the judgment. It, that doesn't sell books. Sorry, Morgan. It's not as exciting as others. Richard? Yes. You're selling books. <laughs> I thought it was invisible. Yeah. Um, 
Did you settle on the number 666? Oh, uh, 666, uh, we, we discussed that last week. Did you guys last week? I didn't hear anybody give an answer. Oh, well, well, that wasn't the question. It was, okay, well, forget, it was the Seventh-day Adventist on the we had the we had the Latin man, Latinos, okay. was 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 the first. Okay, we deal with 144,000. It's interesting to say that these group was harpers harping on their harps. Now, the the Book of Revelation is symbolic, and yet we got a symbolism. And some churches do not believe in music instruments at all. And um, they always said that the harps and the music was Old Testament, and there's no music in the New Testament, mm -hmm. in the New Testament church. And then in heaven we're going to have music again. Huh? Well, anyway. But it's it's an interpretation, but here we have harpers harping on their harps. Um, and this is build, building a, a music speaking in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The other is, uh, in this particular passage of scripture, uh, when we get into uh, verse 6, why don't somebody read verse 6? Then I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Okay, in uh, this, this period, this was, of course, the end of the Dark Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance, where the printing press came along and the Bible was being printed. And the first book to come off Gutenberg's printing press was what? Bible. And what language? German. German. Thank you. Somebody's been paying attention in class. <laughs> but the that was the beginning. The handwriting, everything by scribe, was a long way of doing things. But uh, this was a positive way. But the the beginning of the Bible societies, the beginning of Bible publication, Bible translation, the English translation. God opened up the eyes of the king. And one would say that we wanted that the plowboy of England would know just about as much scripture as the parish priests. Because they locked up the language in the Latin language, and only those that were educated could study the Latin language and read the Latin language, and only the priests who knew the Latin language could read. Later on, you find in a lot of the Protestant churches, they had the Bible. It was chained to a lectern out there in the vestibule, and anybody could open up the Bible and read it there in the vestibule of the church, which was kind of neat. Uh, it was a handwritten copy, very expensive, but made available. <coughs> and here you have, of course, the movable type and uh, the development of the Gutenberg Press and Printing Bible. Now, we want somebody to read verse 6 and 7. Now, of course, it says prophetically in verse 6 that uh, this angel that flew in the midst of heaven, he had the everlasting gospel to preach. Uh, and, he, and he talked about it's going to go out to all the world, earth, and to every nation and, and every kindred. And this is what happened as far as the Bible is being translated. I know there are several thousands of languages that the Bible hasn't gotten into that's still being developed. But once, uh, you know, when does Jesus come again? When every tribe and nation can read his word, understand his word, have his word? Uh, there's, there's been probably more translation in the last 50 years than it's done in the former 500 years. So there's there's a lot of hard work we've been doing through. You know, we entertain 50 and 60 and 70 jungle pilots uh, once a year here for sun and fun flying. Uh, these guys are going into the outermost parts of the world, bringing Bible translation and preachers into the remote remotest areas of the world. And uh, what an exciting situation. I need somebody to read uh, verse 6 through... Uh, 10. 6 through 10? Mm -hmm. 6 through 10. Or 7 through 10. 7 through 10. So, he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of the water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Uh, through seven through which number? Ten. Ten. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. 
They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Okay, quite a, quite a judgment picture. Uh, uh, here, here we have uh, this one verse that says, They fear God and they worship Him. He's the one who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and the waters. So we're talking about God the Creator is still in control in spite of. And uh, we've got the three messages and we have the three messenger angels. Uh, the, the three messages, uh, uh, the final one <coughs> dealt with God's doom upon Babylon. And here we have the uh, angels bringing down the scrolls and announcing their particular message. But this was one person or one religion's interpretation of what the first angel of this message was. You notice what this commandment is right here? You know what that one is? One, two, three, four. What was the fourth commandment? Sounds like two, but Sabbath holy. Yeah, you remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And of course, this is uh, the interpretation that our Adventist friends make with the book of Revelation. And in their interpretation, they deal with that the first angel's message was in 1831 to 1844, first preached by William Miller, who involved the uh, soon advent of Christ, it was later proclaimed by many other Millerite ministers. The second angel's message was the summer of 1843 first proclaimed by Charles Fitch, a Millerite preacher. Millerites, of course, were the Jehovah Witness forerunners. Mm -hmm. And he was involved in separation from the denominational bodies that rejected the preaching of the first angel's message. Third angel's message, uh, January 1847, was articulated in written form in a tract published by Joseph Bates in January 47 on the topic of the Sabbath entitled, The Seventh-day Sabbath, a perpetual sign. He was the first to connect the mark of the beast with a false Sabbath, and James mm -hmm. White made some other key contribu contributions to this particular. Now, is this our interpretation of it? No. But I do want you to know the, this is interpretation of the Adventists. Their problem is, is they set a certain date that Christ was coming again in 1841. Oops, we made a mistake in 1842. And he didn't come, he didn't come, he didn't come. And Jehovah's Witnesses has made the same mistake. Uh, they, uh, they just made too many setting dates. Uh, there's a guy that had up, set up a billboard between Plant City and Tampa, mm -hmm. setting a date that Christ was supposed to come six months ago or a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that his people, you know, some of them took a long vacation. They're at a resort. Some people stupidly sold their houses, yeah, mortgaged them up the hill, yeah. and donated all the money to the organization, which was kind of a pumping, you know, milking a cow until it bleeds. <laughs> the, other, the others just went to work like normal and handled the phones and handled the letters coming in with the support checks and made sure that the cash can still float. But he put up a billboard campaign all over the country setting the date for a specific time. And uh, that's dangerous. Scripture says no man knows the day or the hour uh, but, but God himself. But it's, uh, those that set dates happened in Pennsylvania. I was preaching in a congregation there in south of Pittsburgh, 50 miles, and a couple families came in and he said they were at a revival meeting from uh, that time it was a Baptist church, which I was kind of surprised. And the guy was preaching revival meeting, setting date that Jesus was going to come, and had all these eight, nine, and ten-year-old kids coming down the altar and bawling their eyes out, scared him to death. And uh, this, this other family says, "That's being a little radical, isn't it?" Well, it's not just scaring people, you know, and realize that people need to fear God and keep His commandments, but. The same thing is God's just as much a God of love, right. but uh, they were they were really uh, in you know just really taken off by that particular. Now uh, here's another depiction, of course, of the angels coming down upon the cities. I don't know what particular city this is. Probably New York City. Who knows? Is this the uh, harbor? Uh, but then this is the thought: that Babylon has fallen from out of her, my people. I shared last week how the Protestant Reformation, 500 years later, came on the scene there in Central and South America. That Catholicism has been in a horrible decline in those particular countries. And people have been leaving Catholicism, not only by the tens of thousands, the priests have been leaving the Catholic Church by the thousands. Now, we hear on the other side, that Imam priests have left Islam. I've heard of where 10 priests in Egypt left Islam for Christianity, which is kind of neat. Um, and we 
not really dealing with Islam in this particular session. We're mainly dealing with Babylon or Catholicism and its influence on, on the world. Rome had its heyday as far as under the popes uh, until the French Revolution. And that's where we discuss where Napoleon actually took a, a lot of the power away from the popes and then the pope made a deal with Napoleon came to bring the Catholic Church back into France. And Napoleon said, yes we can, but under my conditions. And so be it. But uh, Babylon is Rome, and he says, come out of her, my people. And I know this fellow by the name of Dick Chambers, former Roman Catholic, would always preach hard on the Roman Catholic Church. And people come up and says, well, Dick, you're going to offend a lot of people. And he says, well, who's going to tell them the truth? He had, he had a bad experience, and uh, he, he left that organization and, and came into New Testament Christianity. And uh, he, he was one that was rather vocal about it. Here's a picture of Babylon. Uh, later on, pictured as the great harlot of, uh, of uh, Revelation. And we're going to be opening up Haley's Handbook and going through and sharing with you some of the ins and outs of some of the crazy things that went on among the popes in, in the early days. The, there were one time three popes, and when there were two popes, uh, one opened up shop in Ravenna and the other one was still in Rome. And the one pope in Rome, guess what he called the pope in Ravenna? Guess what he called him? The devil. No, he called him the Antichrist. And the pope in Ravenna, <laughs> what he called the pope in Rome? Guess what? The Antichrist. So they're throwing words at each other back then. And Martin Luther was one that popularized that position, but the entire uh, Protestant Reformation, and we shared this in time past, but what were the two main points of the Protestant Reformation. Number one, a man is saved by grace. grace. Uh, so he, he preached faith. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, who's the Antichrist? The Pope. The Pope. And that is the entire two main platforms that the entire Protestant Reformation sat on. Now in today's day and world, everybody is politically correct. They don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and they want to get along and go along. And you're supposed to learn to get along with each other, and you're not supposed to have debates, you're not supposed to have discussions, and you're not supposed to be you know, beating each other on the head of the Bible. But reality was, 500 years ago, they beat each other over the head of the Bible. And one group burned the Bible. Every time the English Bible came out, the other group burned it. And if they caught you translating, they burned you at the stake. If you already buried the dig, you dug your body up, uh, burned your body and bones and cast your ashes in the river swift. That's what happened to, what was it, Tyndale? Uh, and it just, you know, horrible things happened for those that were uh, smuggling Bibles and reading Bibles and having Bibles and had the big book, book burnings. But uh, here in Revelation 12, uh, we need somebody to read verse 11 through 15. And this must be a torment. ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Right. So he who sat in the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay. So here we have Revelation 12. Here's the patience of the saints that they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Christ. Yeah, he's talking about the patience of the saints. He's talking about uh, blessed are those that die in the Lord. But he's, he's, he's dealing with the, the persecution. But he boils down to blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from Henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may not rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. 
It's kind of interesting here, Revelation 13. Uh, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, it's the Spirit, they will rest from the labor, for their deeds will follow them. Uh, here it says, And it looked, and behold, a white cloud upon the cloud sat upon him, son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand was a sharp sickle. And here's the old sickle. This is called the last harvest. And uh, here we have the seven symbolic histories, the harvest of <coughs> chapter 14, 14 through 20. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, seeing the cloud was like some man, a golden crown on his head, sharp sickle's hand. Another angel came out of the temple, called in a loud voice, and him who was sitting on the cloud saying, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So here we have the end of time. I mean, this is judgment day, and this is the final God's, God's uh, judgment. Now, here's some depictions of the angel coming out and harvesting the crown of the sickle. Here's some other depictions of the angels over the earth coming down and bringing God's judgment. Here's another picture of Jesus with a crown, a fist, and a sickle in his hand. Uh, here's here's the, the harvester. Now in the New Testament we talk about the Lord of Harvests. Now, when we see there's a need for souls being brought to the Savior, who are we supposed to pray to? Jesus, who's the Lord of Harvest. And what will He do? He'll send forth the reapers. And so that's, that's the area. It's uh, our job to pray, and Jesus' job is to send the reapers. The, uh, uh, here, here's the, some other depictions of the harvest and the reaping. Now, it says, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, thrusting the sickle, reap, for everything's, uh, the harvest in the earth is ripe. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting in discussing that end times. Uh, end times have a that you know, a plane be flying and a bus be driving and a car be running and all of a sudden the driver disappears and the pilot disappears and the pilot disappears and the bus driver disappears and the bus ends up cracked up in a telephone pole and the plane crashes and all these other things happen. And uh, yet in Scripture we have whenever Jesus divided the sheep from the goats and, and the tares from the wheat, uh, it all happened simultaneously. And it talked about the, the tares were piled up first and burned, and then the wheat was second. So in that parable, you have the bad guys are called out. He says, well, what, what happens with the harvest when you have the, the weeds and the, the regular? Do we tear them out? Oh, no, just let them grow till whenever. And then once they reach a certain maturity, then you know what's the wheat and what's, what's the, uh, the tares, what's the weeds. And so he says, in the days, everything's going to be just cut down, and you're going to put the, the uh, wheat in one pile and the tares in the other pile, and he's going to toss a match on the others and burn the old tares up. But in that particular parable, it didn't say that seven years went by. It didn't say that this is going to happen whenever. He just says it's back to one of our man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And the, the whole concept of... Uh, various interpretations that the world is going to get better and better and better and better. And Christ is going to come again and rule for 1,000 years. And then there's going to be uh, a final judgment. And others believe the world's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And Christ is going to come again, rule 1,000 years, and then going to be a final judgment. And then the other interpretation is, it's a uh, point for my own time, and after that, the judgment. And whenever Christ comes again, bango, there's no 1,000 years. Now we're in the thousand year period of as far as the gospel age, the church age, and Christ is ruling now over the hearts of his people. When? Come. The uh, idea of the secret rapture comes from one verse in Matthew. Two will be at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. They built a whole doctrine out of that one verse. Mm, okay. And run with it. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's on that basis. But here we have the, the, the judgment of God. But this, this is the one picture as we, as we move along. I need somebody to read verses 16 through 20. So, so he who was seated on the cloud could swing the sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. 
Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood, blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridles. 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 For a distance of 1,600 stadia. Okay, which is about 200 miles. And this is the, the picture what we discussed here a few weeks ago where uh, some have embellished prophecy and it talks about the, uh, what was a 300 man, 300 million man army? Uh, what was it 300 or 200? 200. 200 million man army. And, uh, and we, we went through all the armies of the world and, you know, America we had two and a half million, I think, World War II. And Russia had some of the larger, and China had some of the larger armies. And it's surprising, Pakistan and India yeah. have huge armies. But putting them all together, you don't end up with, you know, 20, 25 million people. But in some of these literalists are taking that Russia and 200 million people are going to march on Israel. Mm -hmm. Now you can imagine every man, woman, and child, 200, 200 million <coughs> Americans, all, you know, getting a plane right over to Israel, we're going to be a marching to Zion. <coughs> 200 million people piled on airplanes and boats and marching on Israel. But they said that the blood is going to be up to the, uh, the bridles here, you know, for 200 miles. But this is a depiction. And those that are the literalists take it literal. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, these things are in signs and symbols. It was in chapter 8, 200 million. Oh, okay, chapter 8 we, we dealt with. Yeah. And in the symbolism, if people take everything literal when it's supposed to be symbolic, they can really amplify these stories. Uh, and this is some of the, the uh, discussion they had where the red bear is going to come down and invade right over here into Israel. And uh, this was back in the days of when Russia invades Israel. And this was when the bear goes south. And this is based in Ezekiel 38, 39 on Gog and Magog. And this is the question of Gog and Magog coming into and invading with a 200 million man army. With their Arab allies coming in. Now, uh, I don't know. You know, th this, this sells books. gets people come to the theater. And uh, it really makes things exciting and all the other. But to, to come to this conclusion... 200 million people are going to come out of Russia and there's going to be blood for literalizing things instead of symbolizing them. It's really stretching the picture, I'm thinking. Glenn? I don't know of any valley in Israel or that area that's 200 miles long. Well, you can be up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Did you get up the Mount of Transfiguration? Yeah. It was a ride like this. Well, we, did, we got up to Dan. Or, no, no, I'm talking about the Mountain of Transfiguration. Did you get up to Tabor? That's Mount Tabor. Yeah, did you get up to the Mountain of Transfiguration? We saw it, we did Okay, get if down. you get up there, you can overlook the Valley of Armageddon. When we get into Revelation 16, we can deal with yeah. the Valley of Armageddon. Yeah, and there, every the decisive, whoever won that battle won the war. And uh, That valley's not 200 miles long, though. Oh, no, 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 but it's, it's quite a distance. But 20, it's, a, it's a wide open battlefield as far as being fought for battle. But this is, is some of that, that particular interpretation of, of uh, Gog and Magog. Now, we're not going to study tonight Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, there is some relevance as far as Gog and Magog uh, in God's plan of things. Yes, Morty. The 200 million is only representative of a large group. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's, large it's, group, and the, the focus, on, if you study the scripture, the focus is on. Coming against the camp of God, which the rest of Israel one day. The narrowing of the saints is half starting now. And it's going to continue for a long period of time. And that's the whole crux of that thing right there. People look at it that way instead of the amount of people, instead of all of this taking right. place and so on. They come up with some logical common sense. Mm -hmm. Well, the symbolism here is God's going to whoop up on the bad guys. And he's going to be victorious. I mean, we read the last chapter of the book. We see, see, we don't fight uh, for victory; we fight in victory. The 
the interesting thing we, we will go here as far as in uh, Isaac Newton, if we remember we discussed Isaac Newton, uh, he's buried here in Westminster Abbey, along with him is our friend Charles Darwin, the evolutionist, and other, other people, even a playwright, uh, they even have a homosexual playwright that's buried in Westminster Abbey, so they've got various ones that have uh, various uh, honor to be buried in the, the Abbey there in England, but this particular Isaac Newton was the one that uh, took the historical approach to Revelation, and uh, Jerome is one we mentioned, uh, that Jerome lived uh, to see the early breakup of the Roman Empire. This was the first fall of Rome when <coughs> pagan Rome with Caesar's fell. And the fall of Rome to Alaric in 410 deeply troubled him. It was understood that Rome was the hindering power, Paul said, must be removed before the Antichrist could emerge. Explain why Paul could not expressly name Rome in his letter to Thessalonians. He, Paul, shows that which restrains is the Roman Empire. If he had chosen to say this openly, he would have foolishly aroused the frenzy of a persecution against the Christians and then against the growing church. As Jerome died, uh, Gaul was being ravaged by barbarian tribes. Within a generation of his death, the predictions of Daniel and Paul were fulfilled. But the light of Bible prophecy flickered out for a thousand years. So this was what happened. And he was the one that says we need to pray that Rome would maintain stability, because once it falls, our work's cut out for us as far as the church was concerned. And uh, so it was. Now this is one of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, later on we're going to get into Revelation. This is salvation, glory, and power of God, of God Almighty. Uh, Jesus on His throne. This is a picture of the, uh, the uh, uh, second coming and Jesus sitting on the throne judging. Uh, this is a discussion we'll have later on where it talks about Luke 21-24. He will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time that the Gentiles are fulfilled. And uh, that's a discussion of is, is the time of the Gentiles ruling when Israel became a nation in 1946-1947. Was that the end of the Gentiles? Uh, uh, as far as they had Turkish rule and they had Roman rule and they had uh, Islam rule and they had British rule, World War I, and that was, that was during that time. We'll get into that in future discussion. Here's some of the pictures of, of uh, <coughs> Jerusalem, Russian tanks coming in, mashing up the walls of Jerusalem, and this is a depiction of uh, Holocaust and a total destruction of uh, by some of modern prophets. Uh, this is an embellishment and probably an exaggeration, but I'll go on. Some will say that uh, Isis is the new Babylon or the new terror oh. and, and of the end times. Of course, we have King Jesus ruling over and we have the dragon, but, uh, and then we have torments, but this is devil, Satan, beast is those that oppose God and persecute his people and the false prophet those who practice false religion. Uh, in, in a discussion when we get into chapter 15 and 16, we're going to discuss three ideologies, three, we was called the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. And uh, there's, there's a lot of illusions of who the beast is. Now the beast in the book of Daniel was who? Or what? No, the beast in Daniel was what? The head of gold was Babylon. The breastplate of silver was Greece. The Medes and the Persians. And who were the legs? Rome. Rome. Okay, we're back to that. And the beast was called Rome in the book of Daniel. Now, if the beast is called Rome and name by name in the book of Daniel, and the Bible is a commentary on itself, who would the beast be in the book of Revelation? <coughs> Rome. It'd have to be Rome if we're going to let the Bible be commentary or non-commentary. And of course, we did discuss this last week for those folks who weren't with us last time. Let me go way back here. Uh, these, these are some of the uh, Antichrist. Let me go back here and pick the clip. You don't have it. <laughs> it's not, that's the song. Oh, we don't even have it. You, you no. skipped over it. Okay. We, we won't worry about that then. <laughs> 